Yeah, there are these that we have here's the deal. Here, um, here's this uh, professor, this university of the Department of, of Operations Research and Financial Engineering. And um, his research is in statistics, geometrics, data science. Um, he started out as an economist at the University of Michigan, where we first met. Um, mm -hmm. All this was then statistics. That's why we met. Mm -hmm. And then we met again while I was posted in Princeton, and he joined the faculty in Princeton. Um, and that I'm very happy to have a chance to catch up with you. So Matthias is um, not only in the Department of Operation Research, but also associate faculty at the Department of Economics in Princeton, the Center for Statistics and Machine Learning, and uh, the Program of Latin American Studies. And he is an uh, elected fellow of the Frankfurt Institute of Mathematical Statistics, the American Association, and the International Association for Applied Geometrics. Um, and also an Amazon scholar, and he could immediately combine his visit in our department, the econ department on Wednesday, with a stop at Amazon yesterday. Yeah, it was very efficient. Um, so, <laughs> uh, this, thank you, Matthias, for coming. And uh, today, you're going to talk about food services inference for generalized demand type estimates. We're all curious to hear what you have to say. Okay, great. Thank you so much, and thank you for such a warm uh, introduction. It is very kind. Thank you. Do you want to come in? Should you? Okay, should we? Trying to make it awkward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. That's okay. Yes, that's perfect. I see you accomplish a good, a good amount of that. Okay, should I lock the door then? Yeah. So you just need to break the glass. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Good. Excellent. No problem. No problem. Okay. So as I was saying before being interrupted, exactly. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much. This is my second talk in the week. On Wednesday, I had the pleasure to be in the econ department, and I was talking about machine learning stuff, uh, decision trees, and 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 the such. And today, instead, I'm going to talk about something that is very classical. So in this department, I think it will come at with no surprise. This is one of the most classical topics uh, that you can find in any. Um, advanced textbook on mathematical statistics. And so the approach that we're going to try to dive into today is more about inference. Uh, and we're going to try to think about how to conduct inference for this particular class of problems that we um, pick up the, nom the name from, from some work that I'm going to present in a minute. And we refer to as generalized Grenander type estimator. So I should mention before moving any further that this is shown work with uh, my long lasting collaborator, Michael Johnson at UC Berkeley and my former student, uh, Kenichi Nagasawa, who is now at University of Warwick. Okay, great. And so the motivation for this work um, is really one paper and one paper only. So, so in a sense, this is going to be a conversation between uh, five people, we three and these two. <laughs> so unfortunately, uh, uh, Ted Weslin is uh, on the East Coast, and so he could not be here. And then Marco Caron is in the biostatistics department, but he couldn't be here because of family constraints, although we exchanged tons of emails, conversations, and the such. And so the, the starting point for, the, for this paper is to consider a, a versatile class of uh, monotone function estimators. Uh, that I'm going to denote generically as theta hat, um, evaluated at certain point little x. So it's, an, it's a point-wise estimator of some unknown function that happens to respect certain monotonicity constraints. And um, in a very, very nice paper by, by Ted and Marco uh, that came out in 2020 in the Annals of Statistics, they a um, outline what I would regard as a framework, right? So in general, when you write papers that are of the framework type, I really appreciate those papers because they really clean up a literature and you really think about the problem from a big picture perspective. And so that's what they did. Essentially, they, uh, in a sense, uh, managed to put together a bunch of different ideas and problems and concepts from the um, monotone estimation literature all the way from the most classical results for isotonic density estimation to some more interesting and novel and recent uh, procedures that uh, have some connections even with causal inference, as I'll, as I'll illustrate in a few minutes. And they managed to put all this together in a single framework. And so, if I may, uh, at, at the risk of uh, simplifying their paper too much, I would say that the entire paper is summarized in this one slide. So essentially they consider a class of, uh, as I said, monotone function estimators, and then they study the um, 
large sample uh, distributional properties of the appropriate uh, center and scale uh, statistic based on those uh, point estimators. And so their main result essentially is of the following form or flavor, uh, given a certain scaling that depends on a parameter Q, which I'm going to define in a, in a, few, in a few slides, um, uh, but controls effectively the rate of convergence of the estimator. Then after centering, it converges weekly in distribution to a particular law, and the law is that of the left derivative of the greatest convex minorant of a certain Gaussian process. Okay, and this is in a sense a generalization of a several well-known results in the mathematical statistics uh, literature um, that I'll try to review in a few slides. And in fact, most of my talk is going to use the most simple possible example. It's going to be a textbook example. In fact, it's a textbook example of Van der Waal and Wilner <laughs> uh, uh, in particular, which is a prime example of this class. Okay? And so you will see how this works for that example. And then I'll show you how it works in general. And so uh, the main result here is essentially one of generality. So for cert under certain conditions, these monotone estimators will satisfy this uh, distributional approximation. Of course, this law uh, is in general uh, unknown. You have to compute it. In simple cases, you can get closed form solutions. You can even study uh, the density of the law and many other things. It has been done in special cases, but in general, is whatever this law is. And the law depends essentially on, a, on certain parameters. So, of course, it depends on the rate of convergence that is determined by this coefficient uh, Q. Uh, this Q coefficient refers to the first non-zero derivative of the function that you're trying to estimate. Okay, and so this is going to play an important role in the traditional literature it was often assumed that the derivative of the function at the point uh, was non-zero, uh, but it could be the case that the derivative of the function is zero, and then the second derivative is non-zero, or maybe the third derivative is non-zero, and this Q may be in principle unknown. And so uh, a strand of the literature, in fact, has... Hey, come on in. Here. Has uh, asked the question whether or not you can develop inference procedures that are in some sense adaptive or automatic to unknown Q. Okay, and so that will be an answer. We will provide a partial answer to that question as well as part of the, the work. And so anyway, so the law depends on Q and explicitly depends on Q through the mean of the uh, Gaussian process uh, for which we're computing the uh, greater convex minoran uh, functional and then taking the left derivative. Okay, great. And then, of course, it also depends on this particular uh, Gaussian process, uh, which has, which is mean zero. Uh, sorry, this G process, which is mean zero, uh, is it has some uh, covariance uh, structure. Okay. And so this is essentially their paper. It's a, it's a fantastic paper. We, uh, when I read it the first time, I, I felt in love with it. Uh, and, and then when they're concluding the paper, they say, well, this is great. And, and we got all these fantastic uh, distributional results in general, but how do you conduct inference, right? And so the first natural thing that you can think about is to go and actually simulate quantiles from this distribution. And then after, of course, estimating the mean and estimating the covariance uh, function, then you would try to simulate from this distribution in order to form confidence intervals, for example. Okay, and that, that would be challenging for a variety of reasons. Uh, this often has no closed form solution, and so you need to work hard to do that. And then, of course, the natural alternative would be to say, well, why don't we use resampling methods? Well, why don't we try to use the bootstrap or some modification of the bootstrap to try to approximate the sampling distribution of this statistic by repeated sampling uh, with some particular law that we can choose? Okay, and then, of course, you know this literature a tiny little bit, you would be aware that uh, it's well known that the non-parametric bootstrap is uh, inconsistent in this framework, right? And so um, uh, you cannot di directly go to some off-the-shelf methodology, such as uh, non-parametric bootstrap, weighted bootstrap, or, or vari variants thereof, directly apply, apply it to this procedure and get or hope to get a valid distribution approximation. And so the main motivation of our paper is to try to think hard about how to conduct inference in this context. And so the way that we're going to do that is essentially by um, analyzing the construction that leads to this uh, weak convergence result, isolate the sources of failure of the bootstrap 
and then uh, modify in a certain way that will become clear as I explain the construction, modify in a certain way the uh, statistic that we're going to be resampling in a sense, and then apply or, or leverage the uh, bootstrap once we have been, we have corrected the, um, the problem. And that will be essentially the idea underlying the paper. Okay, so uh, just in order to, in this audience, I don't have to do this much for this audience, but I just do it very, very quickly. I'll try to walk you through a couple of examples of, uh, of this type of problems that you would be able to, to handle with, uh, with this framework, within this framework. So it's quite rich. So we have something like seven examples from a variety of literatures. So the most traditional one, of course, is isotonic regression. Isotonic density estimation. So these are density functions that are assumed to be monotonic, and then you are interested in estimating the density at a point. And you have extensions of that uh, that have been worked out where you can incorporate covariates, you can incorporate sensoring, and you can do a variety of things like that. There is also, of course, isotonic regression, where again you assume that the conditional expectation of y given x is monotonic, and you would like to estimate the regression function at a point. And once again, you can extend that um, to incorporate sensoring or covariates and so on. In, a, in the literature of biostatistics, uh, I perhaps is, this is what is most commonly seen. You can find uh, applications to all kinds of estimates uh, of interest with extensions uh, similar to the ones I mentioned before. And as I said uh, previously, it is well known by now that the bootstrap is not a valid strategy without a modification. Okay, so how do we came into this project? Well, we came into this project because we have a companion paper that was published in 2020 before we found uh, uh, Ted and Marcos paper, so we didn't know about it. And this paper actually handles um, a problem that is intimately connected, but different. It handles the problem where you are trying to estimate parameters in an M estimation setting, but actually these parameters exhibit a cube root asymptotics. So if you're familiar with the work of Kim and Pollard, in particular, I come from the econometrics literature, so I'm highly motivated by the maximum score, right? The maximum score is a particular problem that econometricians care about quite a bit. And that is a special case of a cube root a, a type a estimator in the in the language of uh, Kim and Pollard. And so um, we, a, a, in a paper that we recently published in Econometrica, we actually proposed a quote unquote reshaping of the M estimator procedure that would allow you to apply the bootstrap and get valid inference based on the non-parametric bootstrap in that context. So uh, that's where we came from. And of course, uh, after we published the paper, uh, Several people said, well, in Kim and Polar, what the example number one is maximum score, but the example number two is a monotone density estimation. Example number three is, is mode estimation or whatever. So they naturally uh, ask, okay, can you deploy your ideas to uh, monotone estimators? And so that's when we jump into the literature and we thought, okay, is this possible? And in the process, we discovered a lot of things. We discovered things that were transferable and things that were not transferable. And so we had to ask actually come up with a different construction, but ultimately we were able to again have this notion of reshapement, and, and I'll show you exactly what I mean in a couple of slides, where we change the way that the estimator is being constructed in such a way that we enable the non-parametric bootstrap to um, become uh, valid again. And so that's why the title of the paper is Bootstrap Assisted. Uh, we rely on the bootstrap, we resample from the data, but we need to modify the estimator or the statistic uh, along the way. And so actually, to the extent of name dropping a little bit, if you allow me, I try not to do that, it's going to be a kind of debiasing, if you like. I don't want to use that language because nowadays debiasing is so used for everything, right? So um, it's very difficult to know what it means. So, but um, there will be a, a particular sub subtraction of a bias term, if you like, uh, of a certain form. Okay, so that's kind of the the basic idea. So let me try to uh, present the main example that we're going to work with today. And in the process, I'm going to show you a couple of more examples to try to get you excited about this if you haven't seen it before. And in the process, I'm going to motivate this using the language, or uh, rather, I'm going to build towards the construction of um, uh, Wesley and Cadon, where they propose the general framework to analyze monotone estimations in general. So 
to get started, consider the prototypical textbook example. So you can find this. I forget the chapter now, but I read that chapter many times in Van der Waal and Wilner, uh, where they studied isotonic uh, density estimation. So you assume that you have IID data on some compact support, not very important. And then uh, you have the CDF of the data, which we assume is absolutely continuous. You have elevated density. And then we assume that the elevated density is indeed monotonic, at least at the point of interest, but more generically, it should be monotonic um, uh, as we um, for the analysis to go through. Then we care about the parameter of interest, we care the density at a point. Okay. And so the name of the game is to search for all possible functions that belong to the class of non decreasing densities, such that they minimize the likelihood. Right. And so that leads naturally to the um, a Grenander estimator or isotonic density estimator, which can be conveniently rewritten as the left derivative of the greatest convex minorant applied to a particular uh, functional of the data. In this case, in, interestingly enough, just a CDF, empirical CDF of the data. So that's the representation that the estimator has. And so uh, the result uh, that is generic here can be specialized to the special case of this simple problem, although we don't need such a machinery, it already has been solved. But nonetheless, for a mental sanity check, uh, Q will be one because the first derivative um, of, the, um, of, of, of the parameter of interest, so the second derivative of the CDF, the, the derivative of the PDF, uh, is non-zero by assumption. And then, uh, um, and then uh, you, you have the sentence scale, the rate of convergence is cube root, and then you converge to this very particular law, which actually has a name and is known as the Chernoff distribution. So in this particular case, you have a pivotal uh, law up to scale, and the scale depends on certain features of the data generating process. It depends on the density, the derivative of the density, and, and whatnot. Okay, so this is very standard, straightforward from a uh, textbook. Okay, great. So here's the second example. So the second example is a little bit richer. It's more interesting because now we think about isotonic regression. And so now we have a outcome or response variable Y. We have a independent variable X. Again, we have IID. Then we have the CDF of X as before. But now instead we are interested in the condition of Y given X. Right? So it's a different functional of the underlying data generating process, which we assume again is differentiable and monotone. And uh, the name of the game now is to find uh, the monotone estimator in this in this problem. And so again, you can minimize, for example, uh, or maximize the likelihood, the Gaussian, the, the quasi Gaussian likelihood, or minimize the square loss, and then get um, this particular representation. Which again, uh, if you if you know a little bit about the, the literature and uh, you can quickly see that it can be represented as, again, the left derivative of the greatest convex minorant of now the composition of two functions of the data. The first function of the data is simply um, the probability transform. So essentially, you are uh, mapping back the law of X, empirical law of X, to the uniform distribution, if you like. You just, okay, And then you uh, apply the, uh, I have a typo here. This should be without the minus. So you have the inverse, the, the, the weak inverse, the left inverse of the CDF. And then you apply that, and then you apply it uh, to this particular um, Kumsan process, if you like, cumulative sum process, but essentially to this transformation gamma. Okay, and so then you can check uh, with a little bit of algebra, and uh, again, Wesley and Caron already did it for us that this estimator can be represented in this way. And then again, uh, in this case, under regularity conditions, you will have Q equal to one, and then uh, in this case, uh, the rate of conversions will be again Q root, and it will converge to this particular law, which again, in this case, happens to be a rescale uh, turn of type. Uh, distribution. Okay, so all this is a uh, textbook, quite simple. So here's the third and final example. So I promise not to torture you anymore. So in this example, uh, the only thing, the only reason why what I what I reference it is because it's a modern example. So actually, not surprising, surprisingly, not surprisingly, it's due also to uh, Wesley and Caron and the co-author Gilbert, where they, in a companion paper, they think about the problem of causal inference. And they try to estimate regression functions conditional on covariates when those regression functions satisfy certain monotonicity constraints. Okay? And so they try to deploy this technology of monotone estimation to a setting that perhaps 
is more interesting. And, and I assume, having not talked to them about this in particular, that this would have been one of the key motivating examples for which they came up with a framework in general. Because again, the estimator can be shown to be nothing more than the left derivative of the greatest convex minorand of a certain transformation of two key functions. One function is kind of a scale function. In this case, again, I apologize, that should not be a minus, it's an empirical CDF. And then the other one is some particular transformation, which is Catlas, okay, or sort of, kind of that. Okay, very good. So, uh, and again, if you work out this example, uh, you will see that in this case, under some regularity conditions, uh, it is cube root, once again, satisfying this uh, limiting distribution, and again, of the form of a scale Chernoff type. But again, I want you to I want to emphasize that by no means this equivalence here will be true in general. So in many cases, the law will not be an scale Chernoff type uh, law. It will just be some functional of a Gaussian process, and it will be what it would be. Okay, and we have some examples of that in the paper as well. Okay, excellent. So what is the takeaway with all this before I go to um, the specific examples and I tell you what we do? Well, the takeaway is that essentially, what is a generalized random type estimator? Well, it's nothing more than a, a, an estimator that is constructed by looking at a particular functional, namely the left derivative of the greatest convex uh, minorand applied to the composition of two functions uh, that you have to estimate. One function is typically a CDF of the data, but it may be something else. It kind of rescales the data. And then the other one is the key function that determines the estimator and of course the demand in, in population. But incidentally, all you have to care about, and this is kind of their main contribution, is that if you have consistent estimators for these two functions, whatever they may be, and then you plug them in here, then you have a generic estimator with certain structure that you can now analyze in general and get distributional results um, for them. Okay, and so that's the starting point of where we come. So again, this is a, a long detour just to tell you what the literature was about uh, a couple of years ago and how these mono generalized uh, monotone type estimators uh, came about. Okay, and, and as you notice, in this generalization, I'm, for example, allowing for Q greater than one. Remember, Q is this index, co this, um, uh, index coefficient that determines what is the first non-zero derivative of the mean. Right, so that will generate changes in the law itself. Not only changes the the rate of convergence, but also changes the law altogether because the mean changes along the way. Okay, so what are the goals uh, for today? Given this framework and given where we are, we're going to try to develop a, a valid bootstrap assisted and automatic, as I will show you in a minute, distribution approximation for uh, this law. Okay. Perfect. And what, one example that we're going to put this to use is to construct confidence intervals um, that are valid asymptotically. Okay, so that's what we are. Excellent. Any questions about framework or can I jump right into the ideas? Okay, excellent. So how do we go about this? Well, the easiest way to go about this is by first showing you how the construction goes about. And then given how the construction goes about, you will see exactly how the bootstrap will affect the construction. And then based on it, we can uh, see where the failure comes about and how we can actually fix it, okay? And so again, this is a little bit of textbook. It's exactly the type of calculations that you see in the textbook, but then quickly you're gonna see how things uh, go, go south. I don't know why south is bad, it could be north, but whatever, yeah, it goes not the right way, right? So it goes not the right way, let me say that like that. Uh, and, and instead, uh, how we have to fix it. Okay, excellent. So in order to do so, let me start by first looking at the simplest possible example. So if you remember, that is just a monotonic isotonic density estimation. So this is straight from textbook. And um, in this example, what you have, the, the demand is the density at a point. You have that the gamma function that for which we're going to compute the left derivative of the greatest convex minorant um, is the, um, well, in the population is the, the, the population CDF, and in, in the sample is empirical CDF. And the, the fifth function here actually is the identity map in this case, because it's so simple that we don't need to rescale data, change the scale, nothing like that. We were pretty much in business. Okay, great. And so the, the starting point, you can prove this result in many different ways. Uh, for the case of 
density estimate, monotone density estimation, when the derivative of the density is non-zero, Q is equal to one, and the rate of convergence is Q root. And you can prove this distributional result in a variety of ways. I would argue that the modern way is to rely on empirical process theory. So how do you rely on empirical process theory? Well, basically what you do is you exploit a, a particular relationship uh, that is known as the switching lemma that essentially allows you to represent an event, in particular this event, which is exactly what we care about, if we want to understand the sampling distribution of the estimator center and scale, as this event here. Okay, so basically what the switching relationship give you, and in fact, um, uh, Westland and Caron have a generalization of this switching relationship, what effectively is trying to do is trying to re-express the, the sampling distribution that you care about as the probability of this particular random variable index than zero. Okay, so that's kind of the, the first step. So this one I'm gonna take as given. So you have to believe that this exists and is possible to do. And given that we have this, now we have represented the object of interest as the probability of the argmax of a certain process, stochastic process, to be less than zero. Okay, so that's the first step in the construction. And so once you have that, all you have to really do is to think about what these objects really are, because these three objects uh, are effectively determining the law of the uh, monotone estimator. Okay, great. And so what are these objects? Well, these objects are three different things. Uh, the G here stands for Gaussian, not surprisingly. So that's going to be something that converges to a Gaussian process. And it's going to be of the form of the uh, gamma function uh, being uh, localized around the point of interest at the rate, in this case, a cube root under the assumptions that we have, more generally, it will depend on Q. Um, properly centered, it will be exactly this process here. Okay. And so if you know here, most people do know a little bit of empirical process theory, you will recognize this as a very nice process that we can index by V in this case, that we can analyze and effectively establish a weak convergence. Okay, so the end goal at the end of the day would be to uh, study the asymptotic properties of these objects in such a way that we can uh, apply the argmax operator and ultimately compute this uh, probability event. Okay, so in the literature that's known as the argmax theorem. So if we establish weak convergence and so on, then we're able to apply the argmax theorem and ultimately compute this object here. Okay, great. So G will be of this form. And then in this case, L will be just the identity map. So we don't have to worry about it. In general, in more complex with an under type monotone estimators, this object will have something to say, and it will indeed affect some of the features of the switching relationship in non-trivial ways, but that's for another day because it's purely technical and not super interesting. And then more importantly, this M here is exactly what is added and subtracted in order for and crucially is effectively the mean localized, the mean of the process generated by uh, gamma, okay? So that's very, very important. So I need to pause for a minute. So it's very, very clear. M will be the mean of the process properly localized and scale, uh, and G will be the mean zero uh, process that will converge weakly to a Gaussian process along the way. Okay, great. So by the way, this slide is copy paste from Van der Waal and Wilner. So if you want to blame someone, it's not me in the audience. It should be someone else. <laughs> okay, very good. Excellent. So here is essentially what I just said, a little bit more formal. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab this particular uh, mean zero stochastic process, empirical process in this case, very simple, well, rescale, re localize. Uh, and then with a little bit of work, not too much, you can show that it converges indeed weakly as a process uh, to some Gaussian process with the appropriate covariance kernel, uh, covariance function um, that it has. Then A was the identity, so no problem there. And then interestingly here, we have the population CDS, remember, this is a centering, so we are centering the process. In this case, it's the empirical process in itself. So it's, uh, it's centered, and so then we are localizing it, and we're localizing it around X, 
And so naturally, this localization, if you just look at it, is kind of taking the derivative. The, the first derivative comes out with the centering. The second derivative is what remains. And so the second derivative in this case is the, um, uh, the limiting object uh, of this part. Okay? And so it's very easy to see here now, if you can follow the, the algebra, it will be quadratic V is a square have v to the one plus q and it will be some particular functional of the data generating process that obviously will happen if indeed the second derivative is non-zero is the in this case the derivative of density is non-zero uh, but if it was zero we will take three and then the v will become v square will become bq and then this will become the second derivative of f and this will become um, um, uh, will become three factorial, right? Six, and so on and so forth. So naturally, you can see now that the mean is controlled by this m, fun m function here, which is what we added and subtracted to make this process mean zero, and ultimately is the drift, if you like, or the mean of the process. Okay, excellent. And so the rest, I think, is pretty standard. So once you believe me that this is. Uh, I knew this would happen for one seminar. I didn't know for which one, apparently for this one. So let me see if I have more. Yes, I do. Batteries. Excellent. So any questions while I change my batteries? Okay. Oh, and I cannot because they are different size. Interesting. Okay, excellent. So in that case, I'll continue from here unless you have a clicker. Oh, you have a clicker? Oh, okay. That was not great. Yeah, it was so anticlimactic. My next slide was the best slide. Yeah. Yeah, I just lost all the climate right there. It's okay. Yeah, perfect. And you're really leaving. Yes. <laughs> I know, I know. Bye bye. <laughs> awesome. Okay, let's see. Yeah, perfect. Okay, now I don't know how to use this, so but we'll, we'll see. Okay, now I think I figured it out. Uh, maybe. Oh, no, uh, on. Okay, on. Okay, let's see. It's okay, no problems. Yeah. No, no, it was my mother. Uh, my bad. I should have checked the battery before. Okay, the laser works. Oh, hold on, the laser works. Let me try one more thing. Oh, they were... oh not anymore. Yeah. yeah. This one is more stable, so. Okay, there we go. Let's try this one. Yeah. Okay, laser works. There we go, perfect. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Emma. Okay, very good. So as I was saying, uh, this uh, mean zero empirical process will converge to some Gaussian process. The mean will converge to whatever the mean is. And then once you have this convergence, you can get the R max to do its job. And the R max of that will converge to the R max of this. Okay, that's basically what it is. Okay, excellent. And so here's the summary, the summary of the core idea of how this is uh, done, basically. So in one slide, this is the last textbook slide, and the rest is what we do, okay? So essentially, you uh, start with the sentence scale stat statistic of interest, in this case, the generalized ground underestimator. You use the switching relationship, then you rewrite as a arc max of a certain stochastic process. You study the components of that. Those converge weakly to whatever they converge, and then you apply the arc max to that, and then you uh, take limits, and then that gets you this, and then once you get here, you can basically revert back and you study now the law of the process uh, that you care about. I should add, however, and I mean no disrespect here, uh, that for this arrow to be true, there is one tiny little technical requirement that you also need, right? The technical requirement that you need is that this random variable here uh, is such that its law is continuous, or but precisely its CDF, is continuous 
at zero. So this is a small technical detail, but it turns out that we couldn't find it anywhere in the literature being verified, okay? In the textbooks, however, it's no problem because in the textbook, uh, the law is actually an scale of the Chernoff distribution. And the Chernoff distribution not only is, uh, has a CDF that is continuous, but actually is absolutely continuous. And in fact, it has a Lebesgue density and people have worked it out. So it's very nice. But in general, if you are at this level of generality, it is not true that you would have a, a continuous CDF at zero um, to begin with. And so, uh, as, an, as an aside, in the paper, we actually provide conditions for which the argmax of a Gaussian process with certain assumptions uh, has a, a CDF that is continuous. Okay, and so that has to be verified, and actually you can show counterexamples where that would not be true. And of course, it depends on certain structure on the covariance, on covariance function of the process and certain structure on the mean of the process as well. Okay, great. So putting aside that technical uh, digression, the bottom line is that to analyze the empirical distribution of the monotone estimator, uh, you rely through this uh, chain of uh, ideas, and then ultimately you get the distribution characterized as the uh, left derivative of the greatest convex minoran of now this process that um, I just showed you. Okay, very good, excellent. So, what happens if you try to apply the bootstrap to this? Okay, and so this is where uh, our paper starts. So the first thing that we did uh, in the paper is to say, well, we understand well how this has been, how, how this works, and provided that we're married to this particular strategy of proof, now we can just literally do the one thing that we do every time that we think about the bootstrap. Uh, every place where we can, we just put a stars, right? And stars means bootstrap. <laughs> okay, and so I'm gonna try to formalize this idea now, and we're gonna try to think about how the bootstrap fails in this, pro in this context, and that will give us a constructive way of fixing uh, the failure. Once we fix the failure, we're gonna be able to provide a generic uh, way of doing it. So here's the idea. Again, just to get you back on to up to speed, the demand continues to be the monotone density at a point. The key gamma function is the population CDF. If you were to form the uh, monotone estimator, all you would do is to plug in for the empirical CDF. So the most natural way to think about the bootstrap then is that if you want to bootstrap the procedure, what you would do is perhaps you would sample with replacement your axis and then you will generate new axes, and then you will generate a new gamma hats, new empirical CDFs, and then you will recompute the left derivative of the greater convex minorant, and that will give you a bootstrap realization of the monotone estimator. And so you can repeat this as many times as you want, and then that eventually will give you an approximation based on the bootstrap. And so uh, in the paper, we're more generic. We actually look at the uh, exchangeable bootstrap, uh, but here for simplicity, you can think of just the traditional non-parametric bootstrap where you run with you sample uh, iid with uh with replacement okay so then once you do that now these next two slides should be sort of familiar to you with one small change so before if you remember the construction was we apply the switching lemma we study the three terms one term is the mean zero Gaussian process, uh, uh, the mean zero stochastic process, empirical process, which in this case is just is the CDF uh, localized, um, and then the mean is whatever the mean was in order to center the process. Okay, so that was what it was. But now we, are, we do the bootstrap, and in the bootstrap, this is kind of interesting because from the bootstrap perspective, the mean of the bootstrap is the empirical CDF, it's not the theoretical CDF. And so what happens is that you're going to have the bootstrap analog of the stochastic process that is setting, settling to a Gaussian process. And then you're going to have the bootstrap analog of the empirical, of the mean of the process. And interestingly enough, before here, we had the theoretical CDF. But now, because we are in the bootstrap world, what we have is the empirical CDF. And of course, the empirical CDF has jumps. And so the empirical CDF is not differentiable uh, for fixed n. And so in other words, that, that's not enough to claim that this will fail. 
but you have to start thinking about what this mean function will do as the sample size increases. Could it still settle to the right thing in order to approximate uh, this mean in the population on would it not? And of course, it's not surprised that it would not because we know the bootstrap fails in this context. And so the question is, what are all these fail? Okay? And so uh, with a little bit of work, you can show, not surprisingly, that the uh, bootstrap analog of the stochastic process that converges weakly to the Gaussian process uh, works, continues to deliver the correct approximation. Uh, the L function was the identity function, so there's nothing to change here, but in general, it will work in the bootstrap world. But then when you go to the mean, actually the mean does not converge to the mean in the population. And in fact, it doesn't converge to anything. It doesn't settle in probability. It doesn't, it actually, it stays random all the way uh, because essentially you are localizing and the jumps at which you're localizing are exactly the jumps, exactly the rate at which the CDF is converging to the population CDF in order for, we, for you to think about computing derivatives. And so essentially this term here is a term that is fake. So we would like this term to behave like in the population, and they are as the mean, but instead in the bootstrap world, this term does not converge and therefore doesn't give us the mean. And that is the failure of the bootstrap. I'll show you, I'll show you some simulations and you'll see it uh, operating immediately in the background. Okay, and, and again, in the literature for monotone density uh, estimation, several fixes have been proposed. For example, people have realized this and people have smoothed out this empirical CDF, right? And known, uh, Kosorog proposed that, that is known as the smooth uh, bootstrap, right? Or, or, or different proposals have been given to try to avoid this inconsistency uh, or the inconsistency of the bootstrap induced by this mean not converging sufficiently fast, if you like, and not settling what it should be uh, settled. Okay, great. So we kind of identified the source of the problem. Okay, and so how do we fix it now? So what we, uh, uh, therefore, okay, here's the summary. So what we basically uh, learn is that the asymptotic distribution uh, can be established using empirical process techniques and it, it follows directly from textbook. If you were to apply the non-parametric bootstrap, unfortunately, for the non-parametric bootstrap, there will not be uh, weak convergence in probability because, as I show you just now, uh, in here, there will be a term, in particular this term, that will not be uh, replicating the mean of the process in the population. So, what is the problem? Well, basically, the problem is that this uh, uh, gamma hat in general, which for the case of monotone density estimation is just the empirical CDF, uh, in the population is very nice, it's a very nice quadratic, admits a very nice quadratic expansion by virtue of smoothness, but in the bootstrap world, the, ob the analog object does not admit this representation. Okay, so that's basically the idea. Okay, so then once you find these observations, now you have a way to fix it. So what do we do? We basically recenter or debias or change the mean of the process. Essentially, that's what we do. So what do we do? Essentially, we say, well, we would like in the bootstrap world that the mean to replicate this quadratic uh, expansion, we know that it doesn't satisfy it. So what we're going to do is essentially we're going to debias it and then put it back in. Okay? And so when you look at the construction, what the construction basically is doing is grabbing the original, uh, in this case, bootstrap uh, gamma hat, which is a CDF in this case, the bootstrap CDF, it center it to the empirical CDF and then incorporates the two terms that is not being able to approximate directly. Okay? So the third term, the linear term, is directly computable from the data. So you can directly plug it in and just use it immediately because you already have the estimator ready to go. The second term is not directly computable from the data yet. We need to tell you how we do it because that corresponds to the uh, Hessian of uh, this mean, okay, or the second derivative of the mean. 
Okay, and so we need to decide how we do this. But provided that you had an estimator for this to work, then you would just recenter the CDF in this case, or more generically, the gamma hat function, and then you would use that to bootstrap um, your procedure. So uh, another way to say this is that now we have uh, four candidates or four, four, four items. We have the population item, we have the point estimator, then we have the invalid bootstrap estimator, and then we have our modified proposed estimator. So again, the construction is exactly the same as before. The only difference is that instead of using the bootstrap to reconstruct the empirical CDF, what you do is you use the bootstrap to recon reconstruct the empirical CDF, but then you corrected it by adding this term in blue. Okay, that's kind of the basic idea of the procedure. And then once we uh, understand this, then we're in business. Essentially, we can show weak convergence in probability, validity of the bootstrap as a distribution approximation for the um, sampling distribution of the Grenander type estimator, provided that this uh, Hessian um, estimator is a consistent estimator of the object of interest. Okay, and so the name of the game will be how we construct this estimator to make everything automatic. Of course, I have a slide. I mean, otherwise I would not be here presenting this. <laughs> so we have a slide now how to construct, construct this in an automatic uh, way. Um, and then all is going to reduce to a one single tuning parameter that uh, we give uh, mean square error expansions and other things to, to choose. And then uh, that will give you a full empirically implementable procedure. Was that the question coming from you, Alex? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a very constructive talk. So I'm basically building you through uh, how we do uh, things. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And of course, yes. <laughs> Um, is this um, fully constructed gamma star, like pivotal statistic? So is it, is it biased? Or... Okay, so, so, so let me try to answer the question. Let me find the right slide here. Hold on. Here, perfect. So uh, the statistics that we use for uh, inference are this statistic here. So this statistic is not pivotal, okay? It's not pivotal. In fact, notice that very importantly, I drop the rate. So this is very important because this, this inference procedure is rate adaptive, right? I mean, naturally, so you can see that. So it doesn't depend on the rate, right? Okay, great. So um, I think this is known as the percentile method in the bootstrap community, right? Instead of the T percentile method, okay. Or the Ephron method or whatever. Yeah, okay, great. So for this method, all you need to do is to reconstruct through the bootstrap construction. That's why it's a bootstrap assisted. 10 minutes. Thank you. That's very fancy, by the way. Yeah, very fancy. Okay, good. So, uh, so the question is, how do you bootstrap, right? Uh, and so the way that we bootstrap is by keeping, in this simple example, the non-parametric law, right, the, uh, uh, for bootstrap, but we are adjusting the object that you end up using for inference, right? So I guess a question that I think is lingering in what you're asking is, is this another bootstrap? So can I think of this as a just bootstrapping from a different law, which is not the multinomial distribution, if you want, right? And that's a great question. We tried to, to regenerate this as a bootstrap from a different law, but we couldn't. So we don't know if it has a representation as a bootstrap, right? So in general, the family of bootstraps can be thought of as you, you characterize large classes of bootstraps by changing the law from which you sample, right? right. Okay, great. So uh, this bootstrap here is a non-parametric bootstrap. And so you can think of it as just sampling from a multinomial distribution, right? Okay, great, excellent. Uh, okay, great. So, um, so yeah, I don't know if that can be represented as a bootstrap. So the way that we present it is as you tell me which bootstrap you want to use. And as I said, in the paper, we handle the wild bootstrap, we handle the exchangeable bootstrap in general. So we just do exchangeable bootstrap. And then whatever bootstrap scheme you want to use, the corresponding correction term will be here. Okay. 
that's the way it works for us. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, great. And so now the, the, the next question is, can this idea be generalized? And the answer, of course, is yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here presenting this paper. So everything I told you so up, up to this point was about the density estimator, but this can be done in complete generality. So essentially, uh, for any estimator uh, of the Grenander type, the family the, of Westland and Caron, so essentially for any gamma hat and phi hat, um, as long as they are consistent and a few regularity conditions hold, then you have from their paper this distributional approximation, and now you have from our paper uh, this bootstrap distributional approximation. Okay, and the bootstrap again, just to be 100% clear, uses here again a star. A star means any exchangeable bootstrap that you want to use, uh, and then the the green means or the tilde, the tilde means that you grab the original gamma hat, whatever gamma hat is, and then you subtract this expression here, and provided that this function here, this constant here, is uh, consistent for the population constant, which is Alex's question that I haven't answered yet, then you're done. So we have reduced the entire problem to this, and you're done. Okay, so fully automatic, provided that you have this. Okay, and so then to finalize the uh, the construction, uh, well, here I have a slide that in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a little bit, but it's just to say the obvious. So now you can form confidence intervals and, and do whatever you want with the bootstrap, pretty much. And now here is Alex's question. So the key outstanding issue is how do we construct this um, a mean constant, uh, right, a mean function um, in, a, in an automatic way in general? Right? So how do we how do we get adaptivity with respect to Q and how do we actually construct? It? Okay. And so uh, here is the idea of how we do it. So essentially, if you inspect what this Q M function is, if you remember, M function was the uh, Q's derivative of the mean of the process that you started with. Right. So that was how the the function came about. So if you remember, I'll that's why I spend some time here. Uh, here, remember I said, well, what is this M here? Is you differentiate in the population, if you could, you differentiate this uh, gamma function sufficiently number of times and you pick the first non-zero derivative that comes about and that controls the rate of convergence effectively of the process, of, of the estimator. Okay, and so now we look at this and we say, well, again, one more time, we're trying to find the derivative of something that may be non-continuous or not differentiable. So how do we do that? Okay, well, what we propose in the paper is a numerical derivative approach. So essentially, it's like a perturbation approach. So essentially, we grab, um, we try to estimate this uh, object here. And so how do we estimate it? Well, effectively, we this took a little bit of trial and error until we got it right. But then effectively, we grab this function here, which is gamma hat minus this object here. I'm giving you the general formulation now. In the example of the density, uh, monotone density, this was not there. And so it was easier. But here, you need to do it for gamma and for phi simultaneously. And then what you do is you effectively compute the cute derivative of that object. Okay, so that's basically the Qth uh, numerical derivative of the object. And so the only thing you need to choose in order to implement this is effectively uh, how, you, how, how large or how small your step size will be for this differentiation of the mean. Okay, so the tuning parameter here will be epsilon. Okay, and so in the paper, we construct an optimal mean square error optimal epsilon choice. We compute some higher order expansions, and we also give the right rates for which uh, this epsilon should satisfy. Okay, but this, of course, will depend on Q here. And then in the paper, we also develop a version that is a Q adapted. Okay, so uh, you can, you don't need to know Q, and you can actually find the approximation of this quantity here uh, at the end. Okay, and so here we find this Q adaptation up to a certain level of Q. Okay, great, excellent. And so just to conclude, 
uh, so I'm perfectly on time. Let me just show you a little bit of simulations that we did in the paper. So this is a, a table extracted from, from the paper. So we have a couple of DGPs. This is isotonic regression, very simple. So if you apply the standard non-parametric bootstrap, and you just naively try to construct confidence intervals for the parameter, you will see that the coverage in repeated sampling, this is a 2,000 replications, 1,000 sample size, um, is about 80, 83%, 83%, here is 90%, for a nominal 95% confidence interval. So the bootstrap is a, a biased, or so it's not work, it's not valid. And then if you try to apply the M out of N bootstrap, uh, which, or subsampling, which some people uh, uh, like, and indeed it has been shown to be valid, uh, in the simulations, even does not perform very well. You can see that it's well below 95% coverage um, in, in, this, in these examples. Here it's doing a little bit better maybe, but in general it's not doing great in terms of coverage for the 95% nominal target. And then if you try a reshape approach for this case, uh, you basically, uh, we have three cases. So we do Oracle. Oracle here means that you know M. Of course, in the, in the simulations we do, so that's easy. In the second case, we do the numerical derivative estimator with the automatic epsilon data-driven data epsilon based on the mean square error expansion, but we do know Q. In this case, Q is uh, one, one, and three, okay? In these three models, doesn't matter. So we know Q. And then the third one is the one that we don't know Q. So we, we know that Q is be, could be between one and five, but we don't know where it is, and we let the procedure automatically adapt to it. Okay, so those are the three rows. And then you can see that our method does quite well, as it should, given that it, those are our simulations. I mean, they should do well, right? At least that. <laughs> so the, the method does quite well, so it's right at 95, right at 95, and... Uh, pretty much right at 95, okay? And then importantly, let's look at the interval length and let's see if the procedure is doing better at the price of efficiency. And so in this simulation, for instance, our interval lengths are on par or better than the uh, non-parametric, the MR of M bootstrap, which is asymptotically valid, whatever that means, uh, and certainly pretty good overall, I would argue, compared to the other competitors. Okay. Okay. Great. Excellent. And so, just to wrap up in my last one minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, as I said, the the goal of 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 this paper is to say to start by uh, essentially where Wesley and Caron uh, left off, which was how do we construct valid inference for the general class of the under type estimators, and um, as they suggested in, in, in the conclusion remark in, the, in that paper, they said, well, it would be great to have something that is uh, bootstrap based and it's automatic and you don't have to think about it. You just deploy it on the computer and you get it ready to go. And so uh, I think this paper provides one answer to that. I mean, obviously not, I'm sure not the definitive answer, but one answer to that. And uh, here what we say is essentially, well, you can use your favorite flavor of bootstrap. We cover the exchangeable bootstrap uh, class. Uh, and then what you have to do is to construct this reshapement or this re deviasing, if you like, of the mean of the process. And then you have to estimate the mean with this automatic um, data-driven procedure that we provide. And then you're ready to go. You can conduct inference based on, on the bootstrap. Okay, and so in the paper, we apply this to seven or eight different examples um, in a variety of literatures. And so now, uh, as a follow-up work, we are, we are studying a, a, a class of problems that is harder, but also exhibit a churn of type uh, distribution where the bootstrap will be invalid. And we're trying to find ways of uh, using this reshapement idea uh, to restore validity of the bootstrap. Okay, and with that, it's 4.30, so it is my due to, to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we are out of time, but 
maybe we can take one of our questions. I'd like to give, we have actually Marco on Zoom. Mm. So Excellent. If there's any of this, or anyone has a question, but I would like to. I oh, did I mention that Markov paper is excellent, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay. Yes, maybe he's going to disagree on, with that statement. <laughs> you, do you hear me? You hear me? Oh, oh. Can you hear me? Because it's in okay, my computer. Great. Okay, I see. So yeah. only, only Matthias hears me. Um, yeah, Matthias, uh, amazing work. I've told you this before. This is phenomenal work and a phenomenal talk. Um, and so thank you. And um, I, I'm sorry I'm not there. If I were there, I would give you a standing ovation. Um, so I, I have many questions. And so we won't have time for that right now, but I hope to connect after you afterwards with you. Um, but w one thing that I'm wondering is... Um, in the example you gave for the density, where you showed how how the debiasing step that you that you end up having to do on this primitive estimator, so in this case the primitive estimator is an empirical CDF, um, and so the bootstrap works for this kind of uh, parameter, and so it, it is it, so in in other contexts you may have primitive estimators that involve nuisances that maybe are estimated using machine learning or so on where the non-parametric bootstrap doesn't necessarily work for these kinds of estimates or for other gamma ends and different problems. Would that be a problem here? Do you need a bootstrap to work for this primitive estimator to begin with for this to hold um, or not? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. So so uh, let me parse out that question with two in two parts. So first you say the bootstrap works it doesn't work for the estimator that we care about, but it, I think what you mean is that it works in approximating the, the law of gamma hat, right? That's what exactly. you mean? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay, exactly. got, it, got, it, got, it, got it. Okay, great. So yeah, so on the second part of your question, which is the most important one, in the paper, we also analyze cases where you have nuisance functions uh, entering the construction and we give uh, high level conditions for that case and we verify those cases. So I haven't presented it in here, I was trying to do the bare minimum, but in the paper, we do have that case as well. And the first step or this preliminary, you call them machine learning or semi-parametric or whatever estimators, um, at least at the level of generality of the paper, we, we, just high, we, we just have high level conditions of the usual form, right? So you need a better than n to the one fourth rate of convergence in the appropriate norms and things like that. Um, so I guess I'm tempted to say, Yes, it works in those cases, but of course, the moment I say that, I'm sure you can come up with a counter example. So I want to say uh, we provide tools that hopefully would allow you to, to deploy this idea in those cases. So, so yeah, we do have that in the paper. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So, yeah. so, uh, I don't know if there are other questions. I have other questions, but I, you know, I, I don't want to hog. Um, uh, I, I'll let you ask. Uh, I, have, uh, I have a whole dinner to ask. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so well, an, another natural question, I guess, here is that what, what's so this is beautiful that it adapts. You don't need to know the level of smoothness uh, or the the index, I guess, the Q, um, and so that's really neat. It avoids estimating um, nasty nuisances that that are typically uh, appearing in the limit, uh, and in the case that you don't have a Chernoff distribution, in more complex cases, you don't have to deal with quantiles and so on. So that's really very nice. Bootstraps, I mean, sometimes help us also because they're able to pick up higher order terms and give us better performance than um, than inference that's based on the limit distribution. Do you see this happening here as well? So do you go beyond just the convenience of not having to deal with the limit distribution, but actually doing better than um, than intervals that might be based on estimating the limit? Uh, this, is, this is a great question, Marco. Actually, Kengo Kato asked me the same question, not surprisingly, because he has a paper on this. What he analyzes is not bootstrap, but just purely, I believe, a strong approximation based uh, results for monoton regression. And he establishes a very thin type bound in one of his papers. I think it came out in PTRF, Probability Theory and Related Fields, where he characterizes the rate at which D0 goes, right? Or, well, obviously not D0, but um, D0. Right, so the, 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 for the distribution approximation, he characterizes the rate of approximation. And so the natural question that you're asking is, could it, could it be that the bootstrap offers refinement? 
costs, right? So is this zero, is this arrow going to zero faster than the distribution approximation good? And so is the bootstrap providing some sort of refinements? I don't have theory for that, of course. I mean, otherwise I would have presented it. Um, I think you're right that, that this, this is happening. Um, I, I don't know for certain. So I would have to prove that or work on it. And we haven't done it yet. But it's a great question. So of course, you would expect that the bootstrap indeed gives some sort of refinement. And, and again, the reason is in, embedded in the proof. Because when you look at the proof, this arrow here, this arrow, this weak convergence is based on empirical process theory. Right, and so it has some rate of approximation, uh, which you can quantify, of course, uh, a la barriers in bound type. But when you do the bootstrap, uh, maybe this, this approximation is faster, right? Who knows, right? So I don't know. So we, we don't know. The question is, we don't know. Yeah, but that's a great question. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right, let's thank our speaker. Thank you.